Hello, and we've come to another finale for Game of Thrones. And since I've been talking about these things uh, for the last two years, I guess, I guess it's sort of become a tradition at this point that I have to talk about this season. And I really don't want to talk about this season, mostly because uh, a lot of people I know have already said the same things with, uh, in, in better words, but most of the points have already been made. And there's not that much to discuss. Suffice it to say, spoiler alert, I, um, this was a very mixed season. There was some things that were good. There was a lot of things that were bad. And I did not think, like a lot of people did, that this was the, uh, the best season ever. And the best finale ever. Um, I think the people who think that are insane. And, um, are probably not, not thinking very hard. I think... If, um, watching all the other seasons back to back, if, if, if we did this, then people would come, most people would come to a very different conclusion. I think it's the fact that, you know, you're watching these episodes one at a time, and, you know, finally the, the payback that has been promised years and years ago for all the terrible people that have done terrible things within this show is finally coming, so, hurrah, we have that to, uh, to look forward to. So, um... Yeah, I mean, the season was... It's not very good. It's, it's kind of like the, the, the Star Wars Episode 7 effect. Now, to explain a bit, Star Wars Episode 7 was a solid movie in terms of its production quality, in terms of its ability to play off the tropes of the previous episodes and uh, bring us back into the universe we fell in love with, with the other Star Wars movies. However... As a movie on its own, in terms of what it brought to the story, it didn't bring very much. It, it simply did a repeat of things before and offered us a few new characters who have not actually done anything themselves yet. They have plenty of potential, and most of the hype around Star Wars 7 is its promise, is, is the promise of what happens, what, what might happen next, but the movie itself didn't do much. And I predict that as people rewatch the movies and they come to episode 7, this is taking into account that future movies have, have come out, that people aren't going to enjoy episode 7 as much as they did when they saw it in theaters, mostly because it's just going to be a boring repeat. It'll be boring. This season was like that in the sense that, you know, um, people aren't going to enjoy it the same way in the future, I predict. And um, the reason why... They, they're not going to enjoy it necessarily in the future, is that they'll have more time to think about it, and their opinions will match the reasons people like me don't exactly like it in the present, and uh, why people like Preston Jacobs didn't exactly uh, enjoy it in the present. Um, and I don't agree with him that the last episode was the worst thing ever. That's what he thought. Um, it wasn't the worst thing ever. It was a decent episode. I mean, it was exciting. But that's all it had going for, was that it was exciting. Um... So, I mean, let's just, like, I'm, I'm not going to criticize the thing too much, but let's just get through some of the, the basics here. Uh, the show, what, what I think happened here is, as a book reader, is a completely, like, lack, not, not a lack of planning, but just misplanning. They, they made a huge mistake. They assumed that George R. R. Martin would have been done with the sixth book by now. And so, when they made season six... They, they didn't have it all figured out and planned out. They thought they'd have more material to go off of. They didn't because George R. R. Martin's a lazy ass and didn't finish the book. So instead, what they had to do, what they sort of did in Season 5, and I thought Season 5 wasn't that good, was they crammed everything. They, they got rid of a whole bunch of side plots. They got rid of the Aegon, John Connington thing. They, they pretty much contracted Dorne uh, and all those plots to try and... Um, so that they'd have more space for what was to come. But there was nothing to come, because George R. R. Martin hadn't finished the book. And so this season, for the most part, was chock full of just nothing happening. There was very many scenes, very many plot lines that went absolutely nowhere until the very end, right? Um, and I totally agree with Preston on this matter, that so many, like, the, the season is still effectively where the books have ended, at, at where the fifth book ended, even though some things have happened. Like, Cersei's trial was a premonition back in season five, and it still hasn't, it, 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 it took them 
an entire season to get to that. They they had filled the entire middle of the season with all these pl- with all this plotting and all this stuff with the 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 Sparrow and Marjorie, which went absolutely nowhere, you know, because there was still, you know, there's still this premonition foreshadowing her her trial, which finally came at the end. Sam Tarley spent all season getting to Citadel, even though again this was something that was foreshadowed way back in season five, at the beginning of season five, I think, or or at the end, well, one of the two. And he spent all this whole time getting there, you know. Uh, nothing, absolutely nothing happened in Marine with with Tyrion's plot. And again, this is because they're completely off book, and they needed to have Peter Dinklage in in the show because the, he had signed on. And so, sh- hurrah! Let's just have fucking jokes the the whole season because we had to have Peter Dinklage in, and we're paying him. We might as well have him in the goddamn show, and we got to stretch things out. This is fucking. <sighs> You know, well, welcome to art under capitalism. You know, I'm sorry, making it political, but that's really what it is. This is a g- great example of, of um, artistry under capitalism at work. Anyway, um, so yeah, that the whole thing was completely useless. It was just you know jokes that added to nothing. They didn't even add to the characters. They literally added to nothing. And uh, yeah, th- there was nothing effective happening in Marine. It's weird, because they could have done something with those scenes. There were other characters in Marine in the books. There were uh, the Shave Pate, I think, and, and uh, a whole bunch of other characters that they could have talked about and had Tyrion deal with them rather than Barristan Selmy, someone. So it's weird that they didn't do that. They had, um, they, they had just scenes of just nothing happening. They, they had Arya, which, again, very little happened. Basically, she was just training the whole time, and then she finally left. Again, an entire season of nothing happening. Cersei was going to have her trial at the end of last season. This whole season, nothing happened. She finally had her trial at the end. Sam Tarly was headed to Citadel the whole season. Nothing happened. Ironically, Sam Tarly is the only character in the show um, who is actually consistent with the geography of Westeros, because it did actually take him a whole season to get from Castle Black down to the Citadel, whereas the Ironborn fleet seems to cross the fucking narrow sea and go all the way to Slaver's Bay in, like, half an episode, but, you know, tier of little finger teleports around, Arya teleports around, just the, the pacing is completely out of whack, um, you know, on and on and on. There's just, there's, there's, there's endless problems like that that we could talk about and rage about for days and people have the strongest plot is still the northern plot which is saying something because the northern plot is out of character especially with Davos who's who's finally in character at the end of the season which is uh, interesting he totally forgot about his allegiance to Shireen and Stannis until the the end of the goddamn season um, Sansa was out of character, and then they somehow justified it in a way that's just like, yeah, I should have told you about the army. Sorry, John, that you almost died. Um, Melisandre is in there, and she's like, oh, I'll help you win the war, Jon Snow. It's like, well, you haven't done anything yet. You just brought him back to life. But where was, why wasn't she advising Jon Snow? Why didn't they have a scene of, of that? Whatever, you know, there's, the point is... It, it's a sad thing to see, because season five, they were clearly cutting things out, because presumably to make room for season six and season six they were stretching things out because they didn't have anything to put in the they didn't have anything to fill the void it's sad they could have had the dorn plot actually do stuff you know they, they had jamie go back to his book plot this season because he didn't do anything anything of jack for half of this season they had him go back to river run they could have just had him do that last season and then go into the dorn plot this season which they severely cut out you know, because what they basically it was they could have cut it out completely, pretty much, um, because what it was it was just going to go nowhere. But they decided to, you know, they decided to cut it out last season, presume as much as they could or tamper with it, presumably because they didn't have time to do the River Run thing with Jamie this season because they thought they'd have all this other shit to do. You know, they cut out Fagon, they cut out Lady Stoneheart, they cut out all this stuff, but they didn't replace it with anything. They just left a void. Um, if they were going to have Jamie do his book plot this season, they, or last season, whatever, they, they could have instead... I mean, that what that means is what Jamie did last season was completely useless. It, it didn't match his book plot at all. Instead, last season, they could have legitimately gone into the politics of Dorne and had that actually be useful here, because there was actually some politics in Dorne that were happening. And this season, given that half the season Jamie didn't do jack shit, 
for half of it, they could have gone further into the politics of Dorne. I, I just, it's a shame that Dorne's being completely cut out of the show, for, for the most part. That it's that's basically gone nowhere. They're just part of an alliance now. Where it's going to go, we, we pretty much don't know. You know, it seems unnecessary. And it's not necessarily Dave and Dan's fault. It could just be George R. R. Martin's fault or the fault of how this whole thing went down. Honestly, part of me thinks that it's like, if we just didn't have season six, if they waited an extra year to make season six, just to make sure that Winds of Winter came out and they 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 did a good job, that would have been worth it, you know. Instead, what we got just wasn't very good, and um, yeah, um, <laughs> there's 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 not much to talk about there, uh, you know. I, I guess I'll, I'll talk about the characters in. I'll talk about things I hope happen in the books, because that's the only thing I could say that uh, hasn't been repeated by a bunch of other people. Um, this here was, this ten minutes was just me giving you a taste of what I think of the whole thing. Uh, this, is, this is generally my perspective. So, one thing of interesting, um, one thing of interest. When I finished reading the fifth book, I thought, wow. There's so many characters and so many things going on. The only way he's finishing this in two more books is if he basically kills off a whole chunk of the characters in King's Landing. And I predicted, I was like, you know what, if the Doom comes to King's Landing and King's Landing explodes, that'll solve the problem if half the characters die like that. And the funny thing is, is that that's basically what happened in the show. Cersei ends up killing a huge chunk of characters with Wildfire. And, um, it's pretty exciting. Uh, I think it did definitely one of the more exciting episodes this season because this season was so boring. I think my favorite episode this season was the one with Bran and the the Hodor thing because that actually felt like something that was very close to the books. I could see George R. R. Martin doing something like that, pulling off a thing like that. That's very much his style. Uh, this, the thing in King's Landing wasn't totally his style, and I'll explain why in a bit. Uh, yeah, it... it, it a, it was interesting, right? It was it, it was cool, and it makes sense, and I just find it funny that I predicted something like that happening. Um, it's not that good, because it's it ultimately doesn't make very much sense. It's, it's a little out of character for Cersei, especially in how she deals with Tommen's death as a result of that, and... Um, the idea that she suddenly becomes queen after that. I'm think I'm very curious as to how this plays out in the books because I got the sense from the books that after her walk of shame, Cersei was basically demoralized and useless. Kevin Lannister describes it as if she's lost all of her fire. That she's just you know, she's done, she's quit, she she's she doesn't have the guts to uh play the Game of Thrones anymore to any kind of effectiveness. She's just gonna hold herself up and hope for the best. Um, you know, but then Kevin Lannister is killed, of course, in the books, so, in that whole Pycelle way, where, the way Pycelle died in the show, so, it, what's interesting is whether Cersei actually comes back and takes control. I could still see her doing something like this, and I could still see the books going about it in the way that they did. Um, of course it would be different, because if they, if, if the, sh if, if the Sparrow and Marjorie and Loras are all killed off in the way that they were killed off here then there's no way that they're going to be point-of-view characters, that they will be point-of-view characters in the books, right? I think one of the mistakes this season was having, stretching out a huge chunk of time by giving us point-of-view sections with the Sparrow, the High Sparrow, and Marjorie, because it made us think that these plots were going somewhere, and they ultimately go nowhere because these people are totally killed off. Uh, speaking of the Sparrow, and I'm just going to talk about him for a moment, because I really like the High Sparrow, and... Um, it, it's kind of a shame that that his plot goes nowhere, at least in 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 the uh, in the show. I hope in the books that they do him more justice. And the reason I liked the guy was because, to me, he genuinely seemed like the type of character. This is my theory, of course, who didn't actually want to play the Game of Thrones for the sake of playing it. He didn't have that same ambition that the Tyrells and the Lannisters and everyone did. He fundamentally believed in a different system. Um, and there's a great scene of this in season five where Elena Tyrell comes up to him and she offers him lordship and money. And he's just like, this is strange for you, isn't it? To find someone who's not motivated in any way by that type of vanity. Or he says something to that effect, but it's a really nice touching scene because what it shows is that there are some people who are different deep down. You know, the 
let me just decide. A fundamental thing that I, I do not believe for a second that um, this, this adage that power corrupts, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. I don't agree with that, you know. I think part of the problems of power are bureaucratic complexity problems, and the problems are that power tends to attract corrupt people or people who are susceptible to corruption. But power does not itself corrupt anyone. You know, I'm too optimistic to believe that something like that is true. I do believe that it's possible for us to have rulers that are sort of unwilling rulers that see it as a moral duty rather than have that sort of narcissistic ambition to rule the world and benefit from it. Call me a fucking optimist and an idealist, but that's what I believe, and I'll defend that in a, sep you know, a separate topic. But this is what I liked about the Spares. He felt like the guy who was actually that. He felt like he was different than everybody else deep down. He, maybe he was a crazy zealot, you know, so he's not, nobody's perfect, right? But he did feel like someone who didn't want to play the Game of Thrones. And I like that because ultimately, I think if the message of the, um, the show, the, the books, the, the, the story is that power corrupting, the Game of Thrones is a bad game, it's a game that sucks, you know, George R. R. Martin's a whole pacifist and shit, he doesn't like this game, it's not a good game, it's not a fun game, it's not a game that we should be playing as a species, if that's the point of the story, then um, it does make sense to have characters in the story that are fundamentally different in that way, that don't actually want to play that game, and you see how they're different. Now, of course, he was still a schemer, and he still had to manipulate people because, of course, he's still part of the game. He still has to do that just to survive, just to get by, and he still had to play Cersei and Tommen off of each other, but the point is, he wasn't doing it for the same reason. He was doing it out of necessity rather, out of, rather than out of desire, rather than because he believed this was the only way the system could work. I thought, at least from the books, that he was someone, and, and from that scene in season five, that this was a guy who fundamentally believed in a different system. And this is what was motivating him. And I think that that's really interesting. You know, having characters that are fundamentally different deep down. You know, what a lot of shows you will do, you know, is they'll, they'll have characters be, um, you know, at least in anime, for example, they'll have characters that are different, but they're different on a very superficial level, because in anime there is no deep down, and so it's just boring. Um, where in live action, they don't have that. They have characters that are sort of different superficially, but deep down, everyone's the same, right? But a really good story is a story where characters are different, you know, deep down and superficially. And some characters are the same superficially, but deep down, there are people who are different. There are people who don't agree necessarily with the system that they find themselves in and believe in a different system or have the ambitions to run the system differently. And he struck me as that kind of character, and I really enjoy that kind of character because he, it subverts your expectations as well as um, it subverts characters' expectations. So it's, a really, it's really interesting to see a character like that play the game with characters that aren't like that. It's really interesting to see someone like the Sparrow, who isn't in any way a vain lord who's interested in that type of thing, interact with someone like Olena Tyrell, who is, and just see the lack of comprehension in her that she just doesn't get why this guy is doing this stuff, and you know, and it breaks our expectations because we think it's the same thing, even though it's actually not. It's just it's, he's a different type of person. I very much like that idea. It's really interesting, and it sort of brings the point home that everybody isn't like this crazy, evil, manipulative, feudal fuck, and the system doesn't have to work that way. So I kind of uh, enjoy the idea. Not to say that the Sparrow is some, somehow a good person. I, I don't think that. Um, but I, I don't agree, at least with Preston, that the, that the Sparrow was... He was certainly had some sort of plot, at least it seemed that way, but I don't agree that the story would have been made better if he was a schemer. I think if everyone's a schemer, then that just brings in the point that scheming is just a part of reality and that we should all just accept I think if you want to challenge the idea of the Game of Thrones and put forward that it's actually a bad game, then you need to have someone who ultimately doesn't live by that game. Which is, in a way, this is what Preston's critique of, of the whole feudal, like, uh, successors and who's the rightful heir and shit. And, like, John and Danny, and, like, yeah, they're heroic and stuff, and they're good people. They're ultimately better leaders than Cersei or, or Joffrey or whoever, but... You know the re the real problem with them 
at least with Danny, is that she's still part of the wheel. You know, she's saying, like, I'm going to break the wheel, but she's not breaking anything. She's part of the wheel because she believes in success and feudalism the same way. She's part of it. She's part of the system, you know. Her her acting almighty is is totally hypocritical because she's totally she there, at no point does it feel like she wants to change the system and it's not her fault because she doesn't exactly understand that there could be an alternate system, but it's harder to find her to see her as the savior when she's ultimately not motivated to change the system in any way. You know, same thing with John. But granted, John's a little better because he he's not even a um he has no ambitions, pro possibly because he's not an heir in, in terms of blood in any way. He's a bastard. And you can empathize with that side. But the point is, I th this is why characters like the Sparrow are really interesting. And to some extent, characters like Samuel Tarly and, and Bran, you know, people who aren't really going to be rulers or, or, you know, not big players within the game as we know it, but they are big players within the overarching evolutionary game because they are subverting... Their purpose in the story is to subvert the game that everybody else is playing. That's exactly what the Sparrow was doing. That is exactly what Bran's plot is doing with his whole, you know, the, walk, the White Walkers are coming and who cares about this feudal successorship and, and, and all that shit. And the same thing with Samuel Tarly to an extent. So, you know, I really, uh, I like characters like that. You know, they're, they're not playing the same game that all the other characters, you know, are playing. And while... The schemers of the world, like Olenna Tyrell, are winning their game, the Game of Thrones. They're losing the overall evolutionary game, which the Brands and the Tarleys and the the the, the Sparrows are uh, winning. Which is they're playing the game of trying to change the game. It's just a really interesting dynamic. So my hope for King's Landing is that uh, if the Sparrow is dealt with, then he goes down as what I think he is, which is that he is someone who fundamentally believed in a different system. Whether a zealot or not, it's still refreshing to have someone like that who's different. Um, moreover, it, if it happens, you cannot have Marjorie be a point-of-view character because we can't know her plot. One of the problems this season was we thought that there was a plot with Marjorie, and it turns out there was no plot because the whole point was to just kill them all off. Um, yeah. And uh, I agree with Preston's logic that Marjorie somehow knowing that Cersei's going to kill them is just absurd, and there's no reason for her to think that. Uh, yeah. Whether Cersei... Well, whether what's going to happen to Cersei... Cersei's going to meet a very bad end, it, regardless of what, what happens to her here. She's ultimately going to lose and be destroyed. She's probably, like, the, the end-all, like the villain not not the villain in the same sense that the night king is the villain but the villain of like the the game of thrones she's going to lose that game um she's already lost it as far as i'm concerned in the books i actually felt sorry for her in the books but if this is what ends up happening in the in the books then you know i suppose i'll have to change that idea uh so yeah the, the most interesting stuff this season was the stuff that happened with bran um possibly because it was finally a, it was it was distancing us from the Game of Thrones, which has gotten pretty dull at this point, and into the, the great, the, the, the actual game that's being played between the, the White Walkers, the impending war, and, you know, uniting people against the White Walkers. Uh, the strongest plot is still the John plot. And, um, so, okay, there's, let, let's talk about this overall, like, bloodthirst that uh, the, the end of the season has. Pretty much what was happening at the end of this season was characters whose demise had been promised to us long ago was finally happening. A lot of people got their comeuppance. Uh, who, what's his face? Ramsey and Walder Frey and, you know, Marjorie and, and all, these, all these bad people finally, you know, got their shit uh, taken from them. They finally got punished. And, um... I suppose that's part of the reason why people liked it, and the fact that it was all wrapping up. Now, Preston Jacobs didn't like it because he thought that it's just it's adding to the violence and the ultimate message of the story should be an anti-violence message. And I sort of agree with that. Uh, what, I think that action and violence is good, assuming at least assuming that it makes sense. What we had didn't make sense. There, it made no sense how Arya was able to pull off her assassination of Walder Frey. I mean, I thought even last season how she dealt with Marin Trant was overly brutal, like way too brutal. She stabbed him in the eye. It was gross. 
this was just as gross. And honestly, it, 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 it felt even too malicious for Arya's sake. Because at least in the books, Arya never, I never thought Arya was malicious. You know, I thought she was vindictive, but not malicious. What she did was actually, like, cruel. Like, that, that takes some time to, to cut people up and bake them into a pie, and then feed them, and then kill the guy. Maria would not have done that. She would have just killed the guy. There's no, there's no way she could have even been able to do that, let alone wanting to do that. But that's just too much effort for, for, for you know, very little reward. Uh, and ultimately, since this is an anti-revenge tale, it's weird that they're, that they're playing it that way. So that's really sort of questionable what, what, what's happening there. I hope that the Faceless Men have more of a plot in the books, I hope that they're more relevant, they're, they're, there's more to them than just Arya used them to train how to become a killer, and then she goes off and does killing. And I hope that there's more to it. In fact, we know there's more to it, because we know the Faceless Men are in the Citadel with uh, Sam Tarly in, in the form of Pate, or Pape? I forget what the guy's name is, but they're impersonating someone in the Citadel, so... The whole Citadel plot is fascinating. I... Um, but I'm looking forward to all of that stuff. That 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 plot has the most potential, uh, from what I can tell. Um, it's another thing they could have just like pressed that whole thing. But yeah, the 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 revenge is good, like theme is suddenly in this show, and it's just sort of don't get it. It's not quite there because like, you know, John what didn't kill Ramsay? He stopped himself, which I kind of liked. But then, like, Sansa kills him. Well, she lets him get eaten by his own dogs, and, and she smiles at the end. And it's kind of like, it's a little creepy. I mean, you know, th th they're, they're effectively turning into the Lannisters in this sense, because they're just turning into people who, you know, uh, everybody else is an enemy, and they have, to, they have to be as selfish as they can to survive, which is exactly what Cersei has been doing from day one. And we hate Cersei for it, but we love Sansa because she... What she deserves it, she deserves to win. I mean, this is the problem with this is the problem with the logic of, of revenge. Is like, if you give them, if they all, if if they're, if if they ultimately do the same things, then they become the evil that they ultimately try to destroy. Sansa and Arya, you know, they're not, you know, they're not necessarily still good people after they go through all this. You know, you could say that they deserve it because they were wronged first, but like. Th that's th th that's a very ambiguous question. Who's to say who was wronged first? Maybe Cersei was wronged at some point in her life when she was young. You know, maybe she was wrong. Like, we don't know everything about Cersei's upbringing. Maybe she was wronged, and this is why she turned into who she was. Maybe she's she feels oppressed by, like, the, the patriarchal society or whatever. You know, there, there's a whole bunch of things that could be going on. It's, it's, it's unfair to judge one but not the other, even though when their actions are effectively the same. See, this is why I like the Sparrow, is because the Sparrow is fundamentally different. He wasn't like that, you know. At least the, I thought he wasn't like that. Arya isn't a good person at the end of this. Neither exactly is, what's her face, uh, Sansa. And this is ultimately why in the books I didn't really like Daenerys either, because even she wasn't exactly a good person, because she was still part of the system. She was better than the others, but she was still part of the system. The only per like, Jon Snow, I guess, is, is the relief, because he doesn't seem to be motivated by revenge at all. He's the only guy that's actually, like, like decent. Um, so I hope that, you know, the, the, I, I hope that the show goes back to criticizing the idea of vengeance more so than, you know, giving us goddamn torture porn the way it does, and then seems like, yes, revenge, fuck yeah. That's too, like, that's that, that, that mindset is something we should be criticizing here, not something we should be, uh, that's something that the story, at least, was trying to criticize, and it's not something it should be trying to criticize, rather than trying to, um, embrace it, in a sense. And it embraced it with the Hound, which is another weird thing, like, people predicted the Hound was alive in the books, but if he's alive in the books... You know, uh, him living, he's undergone a character change. He's, he's reached his character arc. He's become a different person. You know, he's no longer the hound that was there before. He's no longer angry. He's calmed down. And he's living with, like, the, the Septon or whatever on that island. You know, here it's like, yeah, it's kind of like that. He's going to turn around, except then the people helping him, 
the Ian McShane gets hung up and he goes on a fucking revenge streak. It's like, what what is the point of this? Or is this the message that that revenge is now a good thing? That it's great? Yeah, bloodshed. Like this is ultimately just perpetuating the cycle of violence that already exists, rather than trying to end the cycle. So I thought, and I thought this like Jamie's arc as well. A, a, a huge chunk of uh, Jamie's story was the fact that the cycle was ending with him. He was someone who tried to end the cycle with the way he took River Run bloodlessly, you know? And this is ultimately the problem with Lady Stoneheart as well in the books, is that she's not trying to end the cycle. She's part of the cycle now. She's because She was a good person, but then she's become part of the cycle, and now it's... it's the whole thing continues. It doesn't end. Jamie actually became a decent person. He was trying to end the cycle. So as much as we want to empathize with the people who we think are were wronged, the only reason we think that is because... We don't see how everybody else was wrong. We don't see how the other characters were wrong. So we only sympathize for the Starks. And honestly, to an extent, the Starks are generally better people, and they have honor and all that shit. And you know, to an extent, they do deserve to win. But at the same time, at no point should they adopt this revenge philosophy and take it seriously. So that, on a philosophical point, I hope that this changes in the show for Season 7, and I hope that the books take this... You know more seriously, and don't turn this into just a simple revenge tale. Um, yeah, there's that to say. That's pretty much it. Like all the specifics are um, up for people who who know the show a lot better than me to discuss. Um, ultimately, so long as the show is trying to subvert the idea of feudalism and manipulation and that whole game, then it should. Uh, that whole political game, then it needs to do that by, you know, giving us a good and bad with the characters that are doing this. And so far it has done that. Danny was always painted as this good character in the show, but in the books, it's not like that. In the books, Danny is very, like, there's, there's nuances there. She makes a lot of decisions that aren't good for people, for the, uh, for the slaves that she tries to free. She makes a lot of bad decisions because she's stupid, not because she's bad person, but that's sort of her flaw, is that she's she's a good person, but she doesn't see, she, she's too ignorant to understand that she's still part of the system, and that honest, uh, continuing to uphold the system is part of the problem itself. And, um, you know, with, with John as well. So, I mean, I, I'm very interested as to how the show's going to end. I don't think a show's going to end with the end of feudalism, because that's not how it works. This, this culture has still, hasn't even undergone a renaissance yet for it, it to undergo the end of feudalism. Perhaps that there, you know, um, there'll be some sort of bittersweet ending, but feudalism isn't going to end anytime soon in this setting, so perhaps what we're going to see is some sort of indicator as to the end of feudalism and how, what's, what's to become a feudalism, you know? Because there are characters in the, in the books that understand that feudalism is a totally arbitrary concept, you know, characters like Varys understand this. Um, characters like Septon Maribald and, and Tyrion, to an extent, might understand that it's a totally arbitrary concept, but they still use it because they have to, because it's the system they're in. I just wish more people today understood that capitalism is a totally arbitrary system. But, uh, oof. That realization hasn't dawned on people. Um, yeah, like... Uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I just hope that What's-His-Face finishes the books, and we get to see what the bo what's in the books, and that all these plots that were done horribly are, are done better, and, um, that they get their shit together, I, I suppose. But, uh, it, it still has potential. Um, however, I think the ship has sailed on the idea that this was somehow the best television had to offer. I don't think that people are gonna that Game of Thrones is going to hold up as, like, the, the great, one of the greatest TV shows of all time. Mm, no. That, that's not going to happen. The first few seasons, maybe, but uh, not this latest schlock. Anyway, um, you know, that's all there is to say, I suppose. Uh, if you have questions, let me know, and um, cheers. And here's hoping for A Song of Ice and Fire to give us some of its greatness very, very soon. Because we're all hoping for it. Please, George R. R. Martin, don't die before you finish these books. God damn it.